1978, China made reforms to transform its economy. Before the reforms, China was almost entirely a working class society. By the early 1980s, a new middle class emerged. People had extra income and could purchase goods beyond their basic living requirements. Stylish clothes, modern furniture, and advanced electrical appliances became realistic aspirations for ordinary families for the very first time. The older generations in China um, who grew up during the, the Cultural Revolution, who grew up at, at a much tougher time economically uh, and, and culturally within, within China's history, were best known for their ability to chi ku, to eat bitter. What does that mean? It means to do difficult things for long periods of time at the prospect of, of delayed gratification. And not delayed like, you know, maybe with, with, I don't know if you have kids, but when I was growing up, it would be like, Zach, if you do your homework this month, you know, you'll get, we'll take you out to ice cream at the end of it, delayed for a month. Uh, in China, for this older generation, it was, if you work hard for these 5, 10, 15, 20 years, you're working so that the next generation can have a better life. So the ability to eat bitter is defining of the older generation in China. This younger generation is a little different. Uh, whereas the older generation was about delayed gratification, this younger generation wants to hold wants to, wants to live in the moment, wants to enjoy themselves now. And so whereas the older generation was so focused on eating bitter, this younger generation doesn't really want to eat bitter anymore. They'd like to eat sweet, and strawberries are associated with that. Um, and so they've started to become known as the strawberry generation because they're not as tough as, as their parents. But in all fairness, they don't have to be. You know, it was the older generation. They couldn't travel abroad because because they just couldn't, you know, China was too poor at the time and, and because of obviously political reasons, uh, unable to happen. So the older slogans of the time of the Cultural Revolution, Chao Ying Gan Mei, surpass England, catch up with America. Where was England? Where was America? Most people weren't leaving the province, let alone the country. This younger generation has inherited some of those dreams of the older generation to be able to travel abroad, to be able to enjoy your life. This younger generation doesn't have to think about food, safety, shelter. They get to think about identity questions. Who, who are we? What do we want to do in the world? Uh, in Chengdu, where I spent most of my time in China, we have a toast that we often say when we're having call you use a barbecue fish or a guo hot pot. Um, and it's jin jiao you jiu, jin jiao zui. It, it means today we have booze, so today we'll drink. The idea is we'll enjoy what we have now. How do you think that's going to shape China in the future, this younger generation? I mean, because their views are different than their parents and their grandparents. On the spectrum between like, you know, like a Chinese grandparent who is tough as nails and sort of millennials in America who are like, we're thinking a lot about uh, work-life balance and things like that. This young generation is somewhere in, in, in the middle. They still work incredibly difficult because of the amount of pressure put on them by their older generation and because of their system and because of just the internal competition within China, um, the competition to get into a good school, the competition on on the high school market, the competition on the college market, the competition on the job market, then the competition on the marriage market is so cutthroat within China that you, you can't not work hard. Uh, so are they as tough as their parents? No. Uh, do they want to be? Not really. But are they still extraordinarily hardworking? Especially when, when I think of, you know, I went to a, what's, what's said to be an elite university in, in the States, Columbia University, and uh, I... I would often go study at, at Sichuan University in China, which is a pretty good university, and Suzhou University, also not bad. Um, the amount of hours that the average student in China puts into their work compared with even an elite student, theoretically, in the United States is absolutely incomparable. To Zach's point, millennials are more educated than previous generations, with 25% of them holding a bachelor's degree or higher, and thousands are going abroad one in three foreign students in the U.S. come from China. One of the stories you tell is this woman, a young woman who wants to be a translator, who's there day in and day out. She's there before the doors open. You ask her about the guy sitting next to her. She has no knowledge about him whatsoever because it's all study, study. And then in the end, she doesn't even become a translator. Bella, by the way, I just, I attended Bella's wedding recently and I, and I spoke at her, at her wedding. I was able to give a speech, which was, uh, really special for me. Bella was one of the first people I met in Suzhou. This was at Suzhou Dashe, Suzhou University. She was studying to become a translator. Uh, in order to, to become a translator, you of course have to take a test in China. Um, the odds of, of actually getting accepted are extraordinarily slim. There was about 700 people, I believe, applying for that space, and between four and eight people get it. Uh, the test, 
obviously had a lot to do with translation, but it also had to do with political theory. It had to do with economics. It had to do with math. Um, and, and of course, uh, the political theory of the time. And so I'd wake up at six or seven in the morning and, and go to the library to try to get a seat because it was, it's, it's cutthroat to try to get some turf there and Bella would be there. We'd, uh, I'd try to study a little bit later into the night and I'd get out at 10 and be like, wow, I, I feel so great about myself. I've done this once this month. I'd get out and Bella would be there. And throughout the changing of the seasons, every single day, day in and day out, Bella would be in the library. Um, I think the chapter is called Bella in the Books. And ultimately, when it came time for her to take the test, months after we had met, I think nine months after we had originally met, Bella fell short. Someone who would put that much, I, I've never in my life seen someone put that much work into one test, ever. Um, but what you realize is that every single person in that library, everyone who's plotted out their stake in that library, is all putting in that level of work. And Bella was exceptional, but she wasn't quite exceptional enough. It's interesting uh, thinking about your lifetime to go from Berkeley to Bella, yeah. <laughs> not just Bella's books, but her wedding. Yeah. I saw your eyes light up. What did you say at the wedding? You know, when you watch someone put that much work into what they love, um, it's difficult not to have overwhelming respect for the person. And, and Bella has become like a, a, a sister to me over the years. Um, she was the first person that when I decided to write the book, I, I called her up and, and asked for her advice. And at the wedding, I, I, uh, I always knew that Bella would, would make happiness for herself, not find it, not pick it up, but create it. And, and to meet her husband, and I, I, he, by the way, had to like ask me for approval. I had a very, I had a, he, he had to, meeting me was a big deal for him, which was I was honored to even be in that position. But um, to, to see the life that she'd created for herself in spite of the intense competition that she was facing and to see, to see herself make a, a world of, of, of happiness within what really is a, a pretty cutthroat entrepreneurial um, and market and, and job market in China, I, I was just so proud of them and, and so thrilled to be able to take, play a really small role in, in their lives. When the United States and other Western countries were experiencing the sexual revolution in the 1960s, China was in the midst of their own cultural revolution. So how does China's strawberry generation view the controversial topic of sex? A subject traditionally avoided by many conservative Chinese parents. Again, we often focus on government and, and politics, but young people are often thinking about sex uh, realistically. And, and if you're not understanding that, particularly as China moved from a, from a, a, a truly conservative um, culture, you know, it used to be that, that sex was equated with sin. China's obviously not religious. But particularly during the Cultural Revolution and then the 10 years afterwards, there was a lot of jostling for, for uh, what sex could mean and, and what that means within the fabric of, of Chinese society, family being so important. Um, and, and Li Yinhe, one of, one of China's foremost sexologists, describes China's sexual revolution today as the extremely quiet revolution. I think in the States, when we think of sexual revolution, we're like, okay, you'll do, you'll do, you'll do, and maybe we'll all get together. Um, in China, it wasn't the, the sexual opening up that's happening now is not about having sex with everyone. Uh, it's about having sex with someone. It's about, it's about finding a partner who you love and who you'll, you'll date. Um, and it's about doing it now instead of later. It used to be that only around, I think, 15 to 20 percent, a really a, a minority of Chinese people um, would have sex before marriage. Uh, this was in the 1990s. And now people are having sex before marriage, but they're not having a large number of partners. Um, and so again, the difference is I'm having, I'm having sex with my romantic partner. We might not be married yet, uh, so we're doing it now instead of later. Um, it isn't this sort of freewheeling, uh, you know, hookup culture that we see, frankly, in a lot of American colleges. But it's, um, there's a curiosity about that. By the way, it's, it's related to what we talked about earlier, which is the want to enjoy yourself now. Millennials in China face other challenges. While marriage was common a generation or two ago, now it's normal to remain single. Millennials are entering a highly competitive economy. This is having some unintended consequences. The divorce rate is increasing. Couples are delaying having children. And researchers say stress and tension levels are on the rise. According to a recently published report, most Chinese millennials say the pursuit of creating personal wealth trumps all else. You write, now the post-90 and post-2000 generations are part of the world's middle class. The first modern Chinese generations less preoccupied with needs 
and more involved with wants in particular. Who do we want to be? Their generations will define what being Chinese in the modern world means. So placing your bets, what, what might the future look like? I mean, how do you see that going? It's largely uncharted territory. And, and there's a reason I call them the restless generation, by the way, uh, because, because figuring out who you are isn't very easy. Uh, this young generation, they, often, they sometimes complain that the older generation had it easy. All they had to do was try to get an apartment. All they had to do was try to get economic stability. All they had to do was figure out how to support their family. This young generation has the much heavier challenge of figuring out, okay, what do we want to stand for on the world stage? Uh, what do I want for myself, my family, my country? Uh, what do I, how do I perceive happiness? Uh, do I want to live in a, a big city with a small apartment or a small city with a big apartment? You know, what, all, all these questions are bubbling up. And this young generation is the first generation in modern Chinese history that's had the luxury of even asking these identity questions. And so my bets are that they're going to do it their way. Uh, there's this evolving understanding of what it means to be Chinese that takes from a lot of Chinese tradition. It takes from emphasis on family and emphasis on education. Uh, that's going to be combined with some of the trappings of the modern world. Um, the opportunities of, of a global market versus your, or your local market. Um, these, you know, tradition and, and modernity, these two tectonic plates are sort of grinding against each other. Uh, not really in conflict per se, but also not fitting perfectly either. And this young generation is kind of at, at the fault line of that. They're, they're figuring out, okay, where, where are these gonna fit? How are these gonna become enmeshed? What is the combination of old and new? What is the combination of China and, and worldliness that, that, we, that we want for ourselves? Um, and, and these next 10 years are gonna be, we're gonna watch that sort of bloom into a modern Chinese identity. Give me your sense, since you've been up close and personal, younger generation here in the States, uh, you know, so you have that kind of Western view and yeah. the Eastern view. How different are they? The young generation here versus the young generation in China? They're far less different than the older generations. So if you were to compare the boomer generation in China versus the boomer generation in the United States, almost night and day. There wouldn't be a lot to compare. Uh, and so you're seeing a little bit of a convergence, which is to say that this young generation is, is far more experience oriented in China. In the United States, obviously, we're, far, we're, we're recognizing that you know, it's the things that you have. Uh, it's not the things that you have necessarily. It's the experiences that you have, the people around you. These, these lead to a high quality of life. Uh, young people in China are starting to realize that as well. One of the other major differences is, um, is pride. We're at a moment uh, in the United States, and I, I, I think this is really bubbled to the surface here at the Aspen Institute, but particularly with the younger generation who, who's not really present here, um, it feels like, as a, as a young American, it feels like we're in a little bit of an identity crisis. Who are we? Uh, what do we want to stand for on the world stage? What does it mean to be American anymore? We elected, and not, it wasn't the young people per se, but we elected a, our current president who, who ran on the platform, make America great again, which sort of suggests that we don't feel so confident in who we are right now. In China, there's this feeling that we're on the rise, that, that China is springing up, and, and people are increasingly proud of what that means, of what they stand for on the world stage, uh, of who they are able to represent. Uh, that they can now sort of see eye to eye with the United States. If you ask the older generation, um, United States is a city on the hill. It, it's, a, it's a nation and a way of life that we're aspiring towards. Now you're starting to see far more parity between the United States and China. Uh, that's something that this young generation feels, feels proud for, and I, I think rightfully so. China is finishing the Guangzhou, Shenzhen, Hong Kong Express Rail Link. That's the high-speed rail line spanning more than 140 kilometers making it the world's largest high-speed network. The plan is for it to become even bigger, though, by eventually connecting all cities with a population greater than 500,000. Since Zach has spent so much time in China, he's used the advanced rail system to see what the country is like beyond Beijing and Shanghai. I, I recently took a 38-hour train from Beijing to Chengdu. By the way, it's a, it's a three-hour flight, so. Uh, and the price isn't even that different, so it doesn't make a lot of sense to do it. Aside from, I, I just like having the conversations. Um, and early on, um, I was surprised by how few people had actually had the opportunity to interact with a foreigner in the flesh. I think if you're in Shanghai, it feels like everyone you know, kind of knows a foreigner. 
But once you leave those major metropolises, um, I was certainly a novelty. So uh, one of the funny lines I get quite often is, this is my first time I've seen a living foreigner. So this is the first time I've seen a living foreigner, uh, which is a terrifying way of saying that a lot of people have only ever seen a, a foreigner on TV. Um, and so early on through these train rides, you know, it's sort of like this ET moment, right? You're meeting people, you know, you've only kind of looked through this uh, a media lens uh, at the other side, but never actually had the opportunity to interact. And so people's questions about America are, are in a lot of ways, relatively simple. You know, is it true that, what, what do you guys eat? Does everyone there just eat? bread and steak uh and and i'm sort of puzzling i'm like well you know pizza and hamburgers too but you know how do you how do you summarize how do you represent your entire country it's also a mirror for what we show the world right through these interactions you're able to see okay what is it that america represents how do we represent ourselves to the world not just through the news but through um the tv shows through the movies we make one of the more sobering questions i got and i continue to get is once people get to know me a little bit is um is it true that everyone has a gun? And I'm from California, so I'm not a, I'm not a big, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not a big gun guy. Um, and for me, I'm like, no, you know, it's something I actually really don't stand for. I think gun control is really important. Uh, and then I tell them I went to school in New York and they, and they ask me, how can you feel safe there? And it's sobering because, because they're not wrong. I, I honestly think of, of, of all of my trips, I can't, I can't really relax because I, I feel like an ambassador. It's like I have to sit up a little bit straighter. I have to, I, I'm representing not just myself, but my entire country because this very well might be the only opportunity that this young person, that this young man, that this family uh, sitting on a, a, you know, one of the three cots that's in a, a sleeper train um, ever has the opportunity to really speak to a foreigner. And for me, I, I take that extraordinarily seriously. China's consumer habits have changed rapidly in recent years. To put this into context, in 1999, when the economy was based on low-end manufacturing and infrastructure projects, the average salary was $1,000 a year. As the country's economic model evolved, the average annual salary rose to $10,000. That meant consumers were buying more, opening the door for spending on art, culture, and leisure. Through personal exploration, Zach has researched China's vast young people and its expanding culture. What is it about China that's become like this magnet for you, though? Because you keep going back. There's a yeah. certain vibrancy and energy. What is it for you? When I first went to China, it was because of science fiction. Uh, I, was a, I was a student at Columbia. Um, I was deciding where to go. I figured I could go to Europe and study the past or go to China, you know, you see these, these pictures of Hong Kong and it looks like these science fiction novels I used to read. And so it was, it was kind of a silly interest. I, just, I was more or less on a whim. I will say what continues to keep me fascinated with China um, is China is so linguistically and culturally distant from where we're from. Um, there's so much misunderstanding about China that there's an incredible amount of exploration that's necessary. Um, and, and an incredible amount of exploration that, that's possible in China. Um, that for me, the ability to have an actual skill and passion for something, which is for me bridging one place to the other, um, and then to be actually be able to see some of its outcomes. You know, I, I feel like I'm helping people in my one home here, I'm from the States, um, understand people in my second home, my sort of adopted home, China, uh, help them get, to, get along, um, help them understand one another. And the ability to actually make an impact on a, on a potentially global scale, I mean, for me, it's a dream come true. I wake up every morning excited to think about the, the questions and problems and, and considerations that I, I sort of get to with the work that I'm doing. You talked about bridge. Let's talk about two more Bs and we'll cut it after that. Butts and brains. You talked about that today. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I try to think of ways to make people uncomfortable at places like this. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a popular Chinese piece of slang, uh, really from like 2015, that, that, that period of time. It's, it means your butt determines your brain. So where you sit in the world, the people around you, the conversations you're having, uh, your perspective on things, even the news that you're reading, um, to a much greater degree than, than we'd like to admit, determines the way that we see the world. And, and so the challenge that I, I try to bring to people outside of China 
is to, okay, look, you have a way of seeing things. You have a way of understanding this world around you. How, diff- how, how, how are you going to be able to, to take yourself out of that seat that you're so used to and sort of try to put yourself in a seat in China? Try to imagine what the world looks like from a seat in China. Try to think about, okay, who are the people around you? What are the conversations that you're having? Um, what are the pressures that are on you? What are the financial considerations that you have to sort of we wade through as you're trying to make a life for yourself? What, what's, the, what's important about a family? You know, what do you want for your kids? Most people aren't willing to actually lift themselves up out of their comfortable place and, and put themselves in a seat in China. My goal is to try to get people to feel a little bit uncomfortable and actually go through that process. Because it's that ability to feel empathy for somebody that I think, you know, I don't care if you're a business, I don't care if you're an organization, or on a grand scale, we're talking about world peace. To me, it's that ability to feel empathy that's going to ensure a a bright future between um, China and the United States and and China and the world. And we had a chance to learn about uh, China as much as we could then. A few years ago, I interviewed former U.S. President Jimmy Carter. He talked about his 1979 exchange with then Chinese Vice Premier Dong Xiaoping. The two talked about Chinese students coming to the United States. Together, they signed historic new accords that reversed decades of U.S. opposition to China. Today, the two countries are locked in a bitter trade battle, and the doors, once open to the Chinese in the U.S., appear to be closing. Look, governments fight, economies fight, it's very difficult for people to fight once they, they meet one another. And, and the biggest areas for hope that I see in the US-China relationship have to do with these people-to-people relationships. Um, people who come from China to the United States to study abroad, uh, business interactions between China and the United States. Um, education, though, is such a large part of that. One third of all students studying abroad in the United States right now come from China, one in three. And those are people with in-person experience what the message we're sending to the rest of the world right now, specifically to China, is you're not welcome here. You know, I, I was in Beijing recently, and Chengdu recently, actually, and the lines outside of the consulate, you know, they're extending around the block, and people are getting denied for their, their visas. Um, if it were up to me, I would staple a visa, an H-1B visa, to every single college graduate, particularly PhD students, particularly master's students, um, so that they can come and, and live and work and 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 really contribute to, to the American uh, economy. But what we're doing now is we're saying, you know, we don't, we don't want you, go home. Um, and to me, that, that's so, there's a few things that, Amer- I, I'm proud to be an American, there's a few things that America stands for um, that I feel now we are, we are working actively against. This one issue in particular uh, really, really upsets me. It, re- it really frustrates me because it feels like we're working against ourselves. Um, these person-to-person opportunities, these abilities to study abroad, um, to work abroad, and then to be, you know, these are the best and brightest from within China who are coming here for seeking opportunities. When we tell them we don't, you know, sorry, uh, we're full. To me, it is not, it is not only an opportunity for, for a peaceful human-to-human interaction, it's also a missed opportunity for an incredible contributor to our, our community, to the, to the melting pot that is the United States, to our, to our economy, which needs to continue to grow and and, and evolve, um, instead we're, we're sending that talent away. Well, hopefully your message gets through, Zach. What a delight, thanks so Absolute much. Absolute pleasure, thank you so much for having me. You bet.